welcome up to the stage the founder and chairman, Mr. Steve Morris. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> A little bit of Hollywood. And that's what we want to do here today, a little bit of Hollywood. And I want to talk about the arena. And we're going to demonstrate what that arena means to you in so many different areas of your life. I'll be the moderator here today. We're going to bring a little Hollywood into your lives, some of the things you've seen before on the big, big screen. Perhaps as a metaphor or an analogy to emphasize certain points that I want to make that are so important. We're building a, a fabulous company at so many levels. It has so many dimensions. And everybody that I am associated with is having so much fun doing it. It's such, a, it's such a labor of love that as we create and invent, we become a little bit more original as time goes on. So I want to have a little bit of fun with this. I love the stage. I love to be up here. And what I've seen today and what I saw yesterday and, and throughout the entire conference is that our people from the standpoint of being on stage performers, are becoming absolutely magnificent, aren't they? Isn't that wonderful? It's a captain of the ship thing. If the captain's detail-oriented, that's how it's going to turn out. If the captain is creative and inventive, that's how it's going to turn out. If the captain's always on the golf course, that's how it's going to turn out. Isn't that the truth? I said yesterday, and I, I say it with a bit of jest, that this is a dictatorship. What I mean by that, and I've always thought of brokerage, running a brokerage, and it's one of the things I've loved most in my life was running a real estate brokerage, was a captain of the ship thing. In other words, there's one person in charge, one good way of doing things, I think even from a political standpoint, there's really just one good way of doing things. You can take a little bit from this side, a little bit from this side, and get one good path and go down the middle. I think that's the way it should be done. So to illustrate these points, and to illustrate the arena that we play in on a daily basis, personal levels, business levels, psychological levels, intellectual levels, emotional levels, physical levels, we're going to put on a demonstration here today and see if it can appeal to you as an individual to try to get the most and the best out of you, which is really ultimately my objective. If I do that, I get the most and the best out of myself. And that's pure pleasure for me. So let's have a little fun, loosen up a little bit. Sometimes you sit there and your corset's on a little too tight, your helmet's on a little too tight. Relax, let the shoulders just relax. Let's get playful with this. Have some fun. Teaching, training, and coaching is of high value to me. Passing down wisdom and understanding to others is the finest and best thing that we do, and we're all teachers. Never forget that. Everybody is a teacher. Passing down wisdom, the demonstration, the art of the demonstration. If you watch TV today, Dr. Oz, and I think everybody understands who that is, Dr. Oz, tremendously successful heart surgeon who passes down his wisdom and understanding from the standpoint of health to everybody and does it 
more effectively well from the standpoint of demonstration than just about anybody I've ever seen. So if he wants to talk about your heart, he's got a physical model of the heart and he shows exactly what's going on. And if he wants to talk about cholesterol, he shows you exactly what that is. So pictorially, you know, you really understand what he said after it's over with. The picture is, you know, a, a thousand words. It's perhaps a million words because in one impression, you get it. And you could have read books for years and never got it, but that picture did the story. And you sit there and say, well, from the standpoint of teaching, are we passing down our wisdom and understanding effectively well to the point that they actually get it? It's been said that the interesting part about communication is that we actually think that it transpired. <laughs> you can say the words. Did they understand what you said? It's all about understanding. When we bring trainers, teachers, trainers and coaches up here, people have got something to say, you know and understand whether or not they got to you or not. And part of the demonstration is what to do, what not to do. It leaves an impression. And you can see that if I wore a suit that was too tightly pinched in the middle, to the point that your only focus was on the button that held it together in the middle, you wouldn't hear a word I said. You're too concentrated on the pinched suit. You're with customers every day. You dress the part, act the part, be the part. The first rule of selling is do not create opposition. If you smell bad, look bad, appear bad, they stopped buying you at that moment, at that moment. That's part of the teaching, training, coaching, and demonstrating. That's why we have the kind of teachers that we have. They've already been that and done that. They've got scars and wounds. They've got lacerations. They've been through it. They've been through it. Notice when we put people into position, I always pick cherries from the tree facing the trunk. We select from our own. We grow them from within. I'm not going to put somebody into position to pass down wisdom and, and training and understanding to you that, don't, that, that doesn't understand who we are. Got to been there and done that. I can't take a twisted piece of iron from the outside world that's been in the franchise business for 25 years, so bent out of shape that it's going to take me the rest of my life just to straighten that out. I'm not going to do that. If I did, it's not empathizing with you. We have to have somebody with understanding, somebody with compassion, somebody that's been there and done that. So as we've selected our leaders, we take time and make sure that we select well. Ask yourself this question. From the standpoint of learning, would you consider yourself a good student? I would say this, to be a good teacher, you first of all have to be a good student. If you want to be an excellent teacher, an excellent student, is your mind open to learning? <clears throat> is your mind absorbent? Do you feed it every day? Everything you've got working for you in this world functions on controlled input. Where are you going to learn something that you don't already have? You're going to get it from someone else that's already got it. I could be reading a book written by Emerson in the 1880s, and although the man's not been in the world for a lot of years, he's teaching me, training me, and coaching me through those words. His meaning comes through the words. It's code coming into me, telling my computer system, my biological computer system, how to act and react, how to choose what's important, what's not. Here's somebody that's been dead for years and he's talking to me. And he's saying it just in his own way. And for some reason I might find that appealing or not. But if it is appealing, I spend time with him. I take time out of my day, delegate authority and responsibility to him, and let him pass down his wisdom to me and teach me from afar. Is that valuable for me? Because he's got something I don't have. All I want to do 
is open, openly and willingly receive what he's got to pass down to me, add it to my repertoire so I can be better at what I'm doing, better at who I am, so when I get together with anybody, I can pass down my wisdom a little bit more smoothly, more evenly, more comfortably, more effectively. And where did I get that? Well, I plagiarized a little bit. I specialize in plagiarism, actually. That's what I do. I take somebody else's material, I refashion it and shape it because it was so good, but I just want to put a certain spin on it, add it to my repertoire, and put it out there. And I'll say the words, and maybe I didn't invent them, but then again, I don't know whoever passed it down to me whether or not they invented them. Does that really matter? We're all conduits for the delivery of information. That's what we are. You add your personality to it. You add who you are to the training so you can pass it down in your way, feeling it all the way through, road testing it all the way through. Your gut is a feeling factor. Do you pay attention to your gut? We think up here, we blueprint up here, and then we feel it as to whether or not it really feels good, and if it feels good, we move in that direction. And if it feels bad, we don't. So there's a battery. Two points of the battery, they talk to each other on a daily basis, moment by moment. You know how you feel about it. You know when there's a speaker on stage, you know when you feel really good about what's being said. You also know whether or not you understand what's being said, whether you comprehend what's being said, and you edit it in your own personal way. You're taking little bits and pieces out of it and adding it to your repertoire. That's acceptable, that's not. The bit of a traffic cop lives inside of you, accepting and rejecting on a regular basis. What is your responsibility under, under these conditions? To be in the room, just to be here, two eyes, two ears, absorbing every moment of it, being a good student. Should that be, you know, on your agenda? I want to become a better student. I want to learn more. I want to open up my mind to some of these things. I'm, you know, greatness is something that can be assumed. Where are you going to get that? You're going to get it from somebody else's example. I think in the real estate business, the necessity that up to this point hasn't really ultimately been there is a sense of reverence for the greatness of everybody outside the real estate industry that can be of such benefit to us if we would just simply pay attention. Pay attention. Do you read enough? Do you read every day? Have you made your promise to yourself to self-improve every day? every day of your entire life. If you've got kids, are you not encouraging them to self-improve a little bit better today than yesterday? Just a little bit, spoon feeding, no force feeding. No, force doesn't work. Force doesn't ever work. Reinforce works. Reinforcing, reinforcing. Sean got up here yesterday and you could tell with his presentation Wonderful sense of humor. He was bubbling, gurgling. He was assuring me all the way through for a year he was going to do a good job. And, but you could tell how many times he would have rehearsed what it was he was talking about because it was so automatic when it came out. And it came out with feeling, but it was automatic. In other words, it was impressed in there so many times. It was part of him. It became him, he became it, and he shared it with you. And everybody in the audience absolutely loved every moment of it. And we, we were sitting there saying, there's a star being born right there on that stage. He said, let me on the stage. <laughs> and what did he teach you? You know, this Irish kid over there with a few hopes and dreams. He says, I want to go up there. I want to, I, want to, I want to try this on for size. We see this as an arena, isn't it? It's an arena. Well, when you think of an arena, you usually think of boundaries. You know, there's an outside boundary. Could be a circular boundary, but then again, it could be a hockey arena. That's not circular. It could be a tennis court. It could be the stock exchange floor. Your arena could be your wedding ring. 
there's an interesting perspective. <laughs> and when you think of the arena, there's going to be a challenge involved. You're going to have to rise to the occasion. There might be other competitors, maybe not. Maybe it's just you. Now think of this for a moment, because some of us have a tough time with the idea of competition. Suffer perhaps from inhibitions, fear factor, a little bit of fear factor on the inside. Think about it. If it was a 100-yard dash, or as they now, they've converted most of it over to meters, so a 100-meter dash, and say, for instance, it's the Olympics, if you were the only runner in the race, I've got the gun. We've got 40 million people watching you on TV. We've got stands full of people. But you're the only one there. Fire the gun. Zap! You run your race and you finish. And we get a certain race out of you. Mm. Listen, can you come back in about an hour? I've got six other people that would like to run against you. World champions, each and every one. And we're going to line them up against you. And they're all down on the blocks, biting at the bit. Bam! Zap. And we got a totally different race out of you, didn't we? Simply because they were there. They found adrenaline inside of you you could not find. They found heart inside of you you didn't think you had. They brought out more of you than you could ever do by yourself. Was it important that they were in the race? Beyond question. Competition is a great thing. Severe competition is a blessing. It's a blessing because it brings the most and the best out of you. From a teaching, training, and coaching standpoint, we're dealing with preparedness, organization, plan, organize, direct. The planning involved, the organizational style. If you were a broker and you come to broker training, now granted, there's only so much we can say to you in five days. It's very hard to sit people down for longer than five days. 16 different teachers do brain surgery on these people, everything but a lobotomy. No scars. What are we trying to do? Pass down everything we know in the finest possible way we can with a certain sense of variety, a different sense of personality. Because we know by Wednesday, the lights are on. Nobody's home. <laughs> my mind is not so absorbent. Oh my gosh, I haven't been to school in years. And now you're, you know, shoveling this stuff into me. They come in on Monday morning and they've got their arms crossed, tucked in tight, just like a bank manager doesn't want to give you the loan. You know what that's like. By Friday afternoon, nobody wants to go home. There's sales managers in this room right now who could put on much better sales meetings than they ever have ever done before. If they put it on their agenda to do that, if they sat there and said, my sales meetings are going to be the finest in the entire country, I'm going to get that good. And to get that information, I'm going to download from people that have got it. People that know how to do this. Because I want mine to be the best. Have you given yourself permission to ask for the best? The best. You draw it down and then you pass it on. You see, when they leave that office and they go out on the street, they talk about you when you're not around. Isn't that the truth? As a real estate agent, don't you talk about what's going on out there? They talk about you when you're not around. If a presenter comes up here and does a good job, bad job, upside down or backwards, you go to the bathroom and you talk about them when they're not around. Isn't that true? What your impression was, and you share it with everybody else. Ping pong balls on rat traps, it's bouncing all over the place and everybody's got an opinion. Of course the women picked up more than the men. We learned that yesterday. <laughs> Multidimensional brain. Men are focused on one thing. What are they saying about you when you're not around? What's your reputation? What's your reputation? Could you write it down on a piece of paper? 
What if I gave you a pad of paper? Would it be one paragraph? Would it be a sentence? Would it be the whole page? Would it be a, a pad? Here's my reputation. This is what I stand for. This is how people see me out there. Have you taken that into consideration? Are you known as a great teacher? Have you spent any time with teaching? Have you spent much time with learning? And if I said, tell me all about your learning, what are you learning? Do you spend time with yourself? Do you ever shut the phones off, the computers off, and actually spend time with yourself? Are you comfortable with yourself? I've always said that real estate agents would do so much better if they only got more comfortable with themselves because most people in this industry are not very comfortable with themselves. I work the crowds, that's what I do. It's part of what I do, it's on my agenda. I work the trade shows, I get in handshake and hug them all. I get the best hugs in the whole world because I don't have ulterior motives. I have to teach all the guys in the organization, if you're gonna hug a woman, don't do it with ulterior motives. <laughs> They'll talk about you when you're not around, you're dead meat, baby. But if you don't have ulterior motives, it's the warmest, nicest hug in the world and there is no better physical expression than a good warm hug. You're not getting enough hugs, you know it, I know it, everybody knows it. I got more hugs here so far than all of you put together. <laughs> I'm doing my job. And believe me, I'm enjoying every moment of it because I'm giving my, myself permission just to be a little bit looser, loosen up the helmet a little bit, loosen up the corset a little bit, try to be a little bit more relaxed because these are people. Can you be a people person when you're with other people? How uptight are you with yourself? You gotta get yourself in shape. If you're gonna go into the arena, you've gotta be in shape. Understand one thing, this thing up here, this whole thing up here, this mechanism up here is informationally driven. This thing down here is fuel driven. If I asked you how much you know about informationally driven, the conscious subconscious mind, the powerhouse that's from within you, your central nervous system, your brain, the whole operating procedure, what do you know? Did you take time to learn it? Do you understand the difference between originative and executive? If I put an executive into power, guess what that means? They're gonna execute. An executive executes. Origination, execution. Your conscious thinking mind is an originator. It's a blueprinter. It creates plans. This is what I want to do. And the subconscious powerhouse, which is the bigger side of that mind, you've only got one, gets it done. It's in the feeling side of you. Did you ever notice that it turns out in direct accordance to how you feel about it? Have you noticed that your energy levels are determined by how you feel, what your attitude is? I mean, if you're feeling really pumped, you've got all the energy in the world. But if you're walking in poopy every day, you've got nothing. This mechanism is geared for your attitude. It says, whatever attitude you've got cooking, I will supply the energy to you to correspond with that attitude. Check yourself out. Check out the person sitting next to you. Shoulders down. Oh, my God. And instead of, good morning, God, it's good God morning. <laughs> Another day. Are you in shape? Do you, do you spend a little time getting in shape? I've learned a few things about myself over 50 years of trying to keep myself in some sort of shape. I wasn't blessed with a lot of genetics here. <laughs> you got to work with whatever you got. I, you know, I always just remind myself every time I'm feeling a little down in the dumps, I think of Bill Nasby out running eight miles every day when we started, and he's got size 14s, and I'm thinking of these size 14s flip-flop with these bony knees. <laughs> eight miles in a ski machine. Most of the guys on our staff could not pull it once. Ah, 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 ah. Grind, grind, grind. After 15 minutes, of course, he's got to stop for a pee. But, you know, that goes with the... <laughs> he's back on there. It's not finished till it's finished. But that's a mindset. That's up here. <laughs> What's your mindset? How big did you see it? 
How big? Have you given yourself permission to see it a little bit bigger? Just a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable. I don't want anybody in this room or anybody with exit to burn so hot in their rocket ship on their way to the moon that they scorch everybody around them. What was that all about? Your ego? You go into the marketplace with all your informational format, all your teaching, training, and coaching, your understanding about human personality and temperament and all that, to try to, try to do a good job. For who? The, the customer. Who, if you do it right, turns into the client. And a customer buys from you once, and a client buys from you every time. If they were worth selling once, they're worth selling every time. We're now in a client organization, okay, no longer customer-oriented. For 35 years, over the last 35 years, with the lack of training that's been in this industry, I haven't always been proud of the real estate industry. I love the real estate business, but the real estate industry really hasn't paid attention, put a focus on good teaching, training, and coaching, whereby we become systems-oriented, to correspond with being people-oriented. Got to get that straight. It's a people business. You any good with people? You feel a little uncomfortable every time you shake a hand? I can tell when I shake hands whether somebody cowers in front of me. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm spending my time now just eliminating every bit of intimidation that's inside of me. If there's any intimidation inside of me, I want it totally dissolved at this moment. I do not need it. I do not want it. It serves me no purpose. And if you feel intimidated in my presence, I gotta go back to the drawing board, do a little bit more work. Because I don't mean to do that. And I don't wanna do that. And I don't want anybody on my staff doing that. It's not about scare tactics, and it's not about fear factor. That's not what it is. It's about warmth and affection. And when you get into that, notice and understand where you are. Look at your body right now. Are your arms crossed, your legs crossed, or you're locking out everything I'm saying? See, open is open and closed is closed. I, I've taught body language uh, 25 years ago at the Sheridan Hotel. I knew what Pease was talking about. I didn't understand a lot of what he said because of the Australian thing. <laughs> I, I just felt so fortunate that I knew where he was going. But no, but it's a good point because it's a very wise man. Very, he's got tremendous understanding. He studied this for 40 years. He sold 25 million books. Would you like the residuals on 25 million books? Made at least five bucks a book. See, is that pretty good? Knows it, studies it, understands it, but a little bit of Australian in there, you know, just tweaks it in such a way. If you go too fast, if you've got a D temperament, all of us have as a D, you know, you want to just get everything done just really fast. I have to do everything to slow my horses down. But if I'm going to be in control, not to control, if I want to be in control, I got to get my horses in control. My, my sense of heart, my sense of emotions, my sense of passion on the inside, I've got to get those horses because I don't want to run away. You know, the cowboy, the cowboy flick, when they lose the reins and the, and, the, and the buckboard is heading toward the cliff, I don't want to be, like, that's not my life. That's, I, want, I want to be in control, and I want the straps going through my fingers so I can feel the pulse of every horse. And so ask yourself this question. Are you comfortable with people? Let's go back a notch. Are you comfortable with yourself? Now, if you, what if you assume that position right here, maybe for the first time in your entire life? Say this to me. I'll just say the words, and then you all say it once. I am comfortable with myself. <laughs> now, guess what? I'd be willing to say that probably, probably, 95% of the people in this room, it's the first time they've ever said that. Controlled input into an input-oriented mechanism. If it's done with a sense of repetition, it becomes fixed, permanentized as a habit, a belief system. Beliefs are habits, they're fixed, they're permanentized. And it's done through repetition. What did we learn the other day? Myelin sheath, just imagine that that's a nerve, okay, and your, your brain is made up of nerves, billions of them and they shake hands with each other, okay? They come together and talk to each other. They connect with everything that's going on in your life. And the more you go over it and over it and over it and over it, myelin sheath wraps around the channels, right? And makes it stronger to cr create bandwidth for electrical flow. So it becomes more efficient. Something physical is happening 
So from an affirmation standpoint, which is just deliberate intentions on paper, you're creating something physical every time you do it. There's physical strengthening every time you do it. Nothing is lost. You're creating, because guess what you are? A creator. You're brought to earth to create with your own personal style. There's no person in here the same as anybody else. You're absolutely, totally unique unto yourself. And your job is to be yourself. You're not trying to be somebody else. You don't come here to be somebody else. You couldn't be Susan. You couldn't be Sharon. You couldn't be Tammy. You couldn't, you, imagine trying to be Sharon Richardson. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you couldn't do that. She's the best at that. What's her job? To get the most and best out of herself. To be the finest Sharon Richardson she can be. And she spells it with two R's. I don't know why. Sharon. I got two, two R's in my name too, so I'm with you all the way. To be the best her she can be. Are you being the best you you can be? Have you learned to like yourself unconditionally? No conditions. I like myself unconditionally. Well, let's go to a depth that most people won't go to. Unconditional love. Let's just go there for a moment. Unconditional love. No contingencies. Here's the best affirmation that outlines what that, what that really ultimately is. I am self-determined and I will allow others the same right. I'm self-determined. I determine my own sense of creativity, my own sense of destiny here according to how I feel about it. Because that's what you do. You do it according to how you feel about it. You think and create the plans, and then you execute them with a feeling factor. I feel good about this, I don't feel good about that. That determines. The feeling factor is all important here. The feeling factor. When you love everybody unconditionally, and that's what we're all supposed to be doing, but it's a learning mission. Most of us have not even come close to this. You allow everybody to be themselves. Now, you've got to know and understand you're totally influential with everything you think, say, and do. There's not a moment in your life you're not going to be influential. You dress a certain way, act a certain way. You utilize your money a certain way. You express yourself a certain way or not. Totally influences everybody around you. And they feel it. Sometimes intuitively they pick you up coming around the corner before you even arrive. Some people are very intuitive that way. Sort of get feeling factor. And as you proceed through your life, try, fail, adjust, try, fail, adjust, try, succeed, try, succeed, try, succeed, you're learning. You're in a constant state of learning. You cannot stop learning. You can't. Some people rehearse and other people don't. Bob McKinnon is just an excellent representation from this standpoint of rehearsal. He's a man of rehearsal. He understands what that means. To go over it and over it and over it again. I gotta ask you this, you're in the real estate business. If I took the position of saying your canvassing ability is directly proportionate to the effectiveness of your listing presentation, if that was true, and if we assumed the position that canvassing was a very important thing to do, then the listing presentation becomes all valuable. Then the question is, have you rehearsed it? Number one, do you even have one? Or are you ad libbing? Do you rehearse it? Do you practice it? You see, when you really got a good one, you can't wait to show it to somebody. When you've got a great presentation, you can't wait to get up there and show it to somebody. And that automatically gives you an open door to talk to strangers. And we know that they're not that strange. <laughs> not when you get in close and you shake a hand, you get in close, you find they're just as nice as you are. They got problems. Nature's got a way of dumping just as many problems on you as you can carry. It's not designed to kill you. It's only designed to make you stronger. We all hold ourselves up. We put our makeup on in the morning. Get ourselves perked up. We're burning inside. We got our problems. We're carrying our load. We're trying to look good. One step at a time. Ask yourself this question. Are you living a life of quiet desperation? 
tiptoeing your way through life to get to the, you know, just praying to God to get to the other end without any ripples in the ocean? Is that what it's all about? Because the challenges are just put in front of you to make you stronger. You can't get to this rung of the ladder unless you're a little bit stronger, and this rung of the ladder to get a little bit stronger, and this rung to get a little bit stronger. It took me 16 years to become chairman. 16 years to grow to that position of strength. That's not a retirement position. Think of Eisenhower for a moment. When he got to be president of the United States and they hired another five-star general, he moved up. The delegation of authority and responsibility is put in the hands of somebody else. I finally found after 16 years somebody to be CEO. It took me that long. Now I can do more substantial things in the position I'm in. The only way you're ever going to get rid of me is to beat me to death with a stick in an alley. I'm not going anywhere. Exit is my baby. I originated this company. I brought her into the world. And I always refer to Exit as a she. That's just the way I am. I plan on, and Nasby's already promised me to be a pallbearer at my, at my funeral. <laughs> I'm going to 101. Now, I think that's a moderate goal, but it's much more substantial than anybody else in my family. I plan on going there. So if I'm going to do that, I've got I to gotta treat myself right. I've got to respect myself. I have to honor myself a certain way and start to be good to myself. So I have to start to pay attention to myself. I've got to ask you this. Are you paying attention to yourself? Have you ignored your body? 80% of all the people in North America do not one stick of exercise any day, all day, for the, their entire lives. 80% of them. I got up this morning. I did 12 minutes because I didn't have too much time. I got the kids coming over for breakfast. I got to get ironed up and ready and all this other stuff. Try to figure out what the heck I'm going to say today. And, but I did have 12 minutes to hop on the elliptical. To burn off a little energy to make myself feel good. These legs have to hold myself up here. With a man, legs are the first thing to go. Well, not necessarily the first thing to go, but they're right up there. They're right up there. You got to take care of these babies. <laughs> and if you don't know anything about it, get closer to somebody that does. But don't force feed yourself little bits at a time. For the heavy people that are sitting here, and I've been heavy myself, I know ex I can empathize with you. I know exactly where that is. I got to the point at one time where I had a hard time doing up my shoes, where I was bre breathing heavy when I climbed up a set of steps. I know what that's like. You know, when you're built like a fire hydrant, you can't go up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not paying attention, it's a runaway. It's an arena, isn't it? Up until 25 years of age, you could eat anything, you could do anything, and it would just snap right back into position, a little flickier and your bick, and you had it. By the time you're 35, you're starting to doubt a little bit. By the time you're 45, you've figured out that this thing's got a mind of its own, it wants to go where it wants to go. <laughs> By the time you're 55, you've thrown up your arms and said, I don't have a chance here. I'm out of control. I don't know what to do. Well, if I just layer my clothing, <laughs> I can create camouflage. I'll armor myself up a little bit differently. Well, let's talk about armor just for a minute. Look at this over here. You know, we go back to Roman times. We actually think, you know, we thought for years, it's kind of interesting when you're wearing this. You know, you talk about psychological armor. Physical armor. I was actually going to wear this on stage. They talked me out of it, but I was going to. I thought that'd be kind of cute, just come up here in this. Uh, you know, you have to, maybe I'd wear some bottoms. But, you know, this. <laughs> it's a little short. Do you know, just, just from the standpoint of what you understand, what you don't understand, that they never used iron or metal? They didn't use leather for this. Do you know what they used for this to protect themselves, the Romans, back in those days? Linen. 
layered linen. Scientific studies have shown for flexibility, pliability, and durability to prevent piercing of arrows, they could layer linen together and it became so incredibly strong and yet you could bend with it. You could ride horses with it. You could fight with it. So when we see it in a movie, you know, we just interpret that and we think, well, I guess they were, you know, they got a blacksmith there hammering that out and making the armor. And that's not what they used at all. In some cases, you know, we've misinterpreted what's been in front of us all the way along. Controlled input, analysis of what's there, choosing what we want and what we don't want, feeling good about it, respecting our bodies, getting them in shape, looking at the food that we've got coming in the door, whether or not, you know, our fork is our friend or our foe. Do you pay attention to that? As I go around and I, I put on a presentation called Face Off, we get into vitamins, minerals, and some of the ingredients necessary for your body. Your body, you know what food is? If you look at your body as one of the most magnificent computers ever put together that you could ever imagine, you got a brand new Mercedes there, high powered, biggest engine they make. While you sit there and pour back a Coca Cola, you would never take that Coca Cola and put it in the gas tank of the Mercedes. The Mercedes computer, the computer system, believe me, best of the best, top line, so on and so forth, great computers. You would never pour that Coca-Cola in that gas tank. Every man that's in here for sure, and the women, you know, they, they pretty well understand, you don't do that. You would drink it. You would pour it into the most magnificent computer system ever designed in the entire earth. But you actually respect your car more. You would never feed it to your car. Isn't that interesting with regard to our understanding about how this all works? Food is code. It's code for your internal computer. It's code. A computer interprets code. We see it as food. We know it tastes a certain way. We know what we're drawn to and what not. We've never thought about it that way. It's computer code. It tells your body how to act and react. It tells your body whether or not to live a long time or not. It tells your body whether or not you're going to be energetic or not energetic. And you know what kind of endurance you've got or not. You know that. And every once in a while you get to road test it from the standpoint of athleticism and get out there and go. And whether or not you even do anything more than walk to your car from the standpoint of physical expression. You got 660 muscles. Wow. Wow. You got 243 joints. Huh. You got 306 bones in there. Every one of them perfectly designed to do certain things, to move a certain way. Are you moving all your muscles the way they've been designed to move, or are you moving them at all? And you wonder why when they start to wither away and disappear. You know, and your arms are about as big as your ankles, and you're starting to wonder why. It's not being used. Whatever, you know, you've been blessed with is designed for use. And then you wonder why you can't go to sleep at night, because this motor is overused and this one is underused. If you want to shut off the mental, you do something physical. Some people sitting here do not any physical activity at all. Now let's go the opposite way. Let's, let's take somebody that really does. Oakley Signs in Florida, one of our suppliers for years and years and years. A fellow named Keith. Great guy, talk to him all the time. He's sitting here in the audience today. Guess what Keith has accomplished? He's just finished, imagine this. It took him 11 years to do it. 50 marathons, one in every state of the union. There he sits over there, stand up. <laughs> 50 marathons, 11 years, do the math, do the math. 
That's like five a year. 26 miles. Under an electron microscope, I've seen them photograph someone's leg, leg muscles and tendons and ligaments and the rest of it. Under an electron microscope, after a marathon, you have no idea the turmoil that the body has gone through as a result of 26 grueling miles. My gosh. And you can't find 20 minutes. 20 minutes is 4% of your day. I just finished Schwarzenegger's book, Total Recall. Fabulous book. I listened to the stuff on tape. There's two types of tape, typically Arnold. The book is this thick, 650 pages. I wasn't about to, to attempt that. I wasn't going to spend that much time with Arnold. <laughs> two, two sets of tapes. One has got seven discs, CD. I'm, I'm a CD guy. I listen with these things. And the other one's 20 CDs. I figured, no, seven CDs is enough. Thank you very much. I just want to get the drift, see where he's going, see how it feels. He stressed in there, and of course, there's a tragedy built into the story. We all know that. Fabulous, incredible accomplishments upside down and backwards. But I've, I've learned along the way that we in the peanut gallery love to crucify our champions. Thumbs up or a thumbs down, isn't that the way it goes? Love to crucify our champions. So when somebody trips and falls along the way, we talk about them when they're not around in the bathroom. And when you weigh all the good stuff done versus some of the tripping and falling that you happen to see that was publicized. See, your skeletons in your closet are not being publicized. And you can't come to this meeting or any meeting and tell me you haven't got some skeletons, some serious skeletons in your closet because you know you do. You just don't want them exposed like that. That would be the horror story of your life. But there is a tendency with the arena for the peanut gallery to want to see blood. They want to see some blood on the rug. And so he's gone through that. As I went through it, and I was a younger guy, uh, Arnold's one year younger than me, and, and I watched him very carefully do what he was doing. And he stresses repetition and mileage with everything in your life. You gotta do the repetitions. You gotta do the mileage. You gotta pay the price of time, or you can't climb to the next re uh, rung of that ladder. And when we see achievers, we've got so many achievers on this stage yesterday. We've done more trophies this year than we did the previous year. And champions, one and all, and some people doing things I can't imagine ever doing. I, I couldn't imagine doing some of the stuff that you guys do. I, I've never been there. I've never done it. I sit there in absolute amazement when I see some of the numbers. It's enthralling. It's enchanting. It's part of the reason why I went into management in the first place was try to get the most and the best out of people and then watch them do better stuff than I could ever do myself. That is pure pleasure if you're in management for the right reasons. And I know and understand that it takes a lot of repetitions. And it takes a lot of mileage. Now, all of us work, especially as a real estate agent, in an office. And there's a manager. And the brokerage business says there's got to be somebody in charge that bears responsibility for those listings. The listings are all taken in the broker's name. The overseer. That person is there to replace themselves with other people that want to go forth and do things that they perhaps can't do or won't do to try to create a sense of leverage and a sense of momentum in the marketplace. That's why they do it in the first place. It's a competitive thing. There's other competitors in the arena. You've got certain objectives, a certain feeling factor. You know yourself in your own office right now, the feeling factor that's in there. You know whether or not you participate in the real estate meetings that you have on a regular basis or maybe not so regular. You know what that is, and you're keeping score, and you're talking about the manager when, you're not, when they're not around. You know whether or not they spend time to put together a good sales meeting whereby the input was absolutely fabulous and irresistible, and that's why you all showed up or not. Isn't that the truth? And in most cases, only 40 to 50% of the people ever show up because it was boring. There was no preparation at all. It was a, a last moment thing. I got to put on that damn meeting. And nobody showed up. 
And then they suffer from resentment. There's only two emotions you're ever going to really feel in this business. Guilt and resentment. Guilt is when you're not living up to somebody else's standards. And you feel it right here. And if you just participated, just got involved, if you're only there for five minutes, for crying out loud, you wouldn't have suffered the same guilt. And resentment is when they don't live up to your standards. Which one are you suffering from? One of those is your favorite. No, no, choose. Do I suffer from guilt on a regular basis? I'm always feeling guilty about this or that because I'm not living up to somebody else's standards or not. Or I'm resenting them for not showing up at my meeting. And you go up and smoke in the arena in here, in your body, every cell, every corpuscle in your body experiences that emotion. And you're actually shortening your life putting it through more tension, anxiety, and stress than it will ever experience out there with other people. Going up in smoke, out of anger. How do you experience? You see, with the arena, we see one thing that's flourishing on a regular basis, and that's testosterone, the angry hormone. Some of us have got a lot of it. And some of us don't. Women have about 25 to 40 times less testosterone than a man. Now, what Pease, if you read his book, and I've done it, I've read, I'm into that kind of stuff, I study it, learn it. 10% um, of all the women have a male brain. They're hunters. I think we saw one a couple of minutes ago. Quite often they have red hair and they're Irish, but you know, that's a, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> and they have high testosterone. Higher. Let's just say higher, okay? Some of us have lower, some of us have higher. As a man typically gets a little bit older, his testosterone levels start to fall off. That's why he's a better grandfather than he ever was a father. He was too angry when he was younger. Couldn't control his own horses, couldn't control his own anger. I know I've been there, I've done that. It's just too easy to get angry. About what? It not going the way you wanted it to go? Oh, it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out? Go back to the drawing board. What do you have to do under all circumstances? You've got to go back to the drawing board, back to the drawing board, back to the drawing board. It didn't turn out the way I wanted it to go back to the drawing board. That's what we do with a thing like this. We, we have a convention, then we go back to the drawing board. I don't do that. I don't allow it in my office until March. We don't assess what goes on here until March. We don't think about it or anything else because it has a certain radiation effect. It has a radiation effect and I want that to flow and flow and flow. And it seems that around the first week, second week of March every year, it's time to start talking about this year's convention. But allow last year's convention to radiate, right? It has an effect on everyone. Don't start analyzing and criticizing and scrutinizing everything the first day you get back. You stop the flow. And stupid is the stupid does, and life's a big chocolate box. You know the guy that said that. A very wise man, by the way. You got a manager in your office. Does that person use intimidation? And if that was the case, does that make you want to come to more meetings? Does that make you want to participate a little bit more? Is intimidation a good tool? Intimidation comes from the expression of Testosterone, the angry hormone, scare tactics. But there's always a reaction, isn't there? Action and reaction. Was Newton right with regard to that? For every action that's put out, an equal and opposite reaction, but it doesn't always come back through the same door. Sometimes it comes back through a window. You don't even see it coming. Because when you deliver the bomb and they were unsuspecting, it doesn't immediately come back and hit you. Nature waits until you're unsuspecting and then sends it to you just the way you delivered it. Comes back through a window, but it's, there's always a payoff. You put it out, it's coming back. How does it come back? Multiplied, multiplied, even worse, even worse than what you put out. But the good stuff out, good stuff in, bad stuff out, bad stuff in. And it always comes in from interesting directions. In The Godfather, it says it very clearly. Beware of your enemies, they'll always strike back at, at what you love most. What do you love most? The love of money is the root of all evil. What does that mean? You're not supposed to have any money? No, you can't live in this world without money. I think the, uh, the definition of being rich is having enough money to buy anything you want anytime you want. I don't think you have to put zeros after it. I just want to have enough money to be able to buy anything I want anytime I want at my beck and call. Just have enough for that. It's not all about that. 
It's all about the experiences that we get on the way there. The real estate business is not about the money we pay you. The, the real estate business is about the kind of person that you turn into as a result of the experience. Have you noticed yourself growing since you've been with Exit? Hey, you can feel it. You grow through what? Association. There's a radiation effect here. They rub off on you. You can't not get that. You can't not be in this room and, and not pick up everything that's coming out. It just feels good. And you sit there and say, you know, I felt so good when I went to that convention. And we know that the ones that come will climb over cut glass to come again. You'll be here because it's the most special thing that's going to happen to you all year long. That's why we spend so much time preparing and trying to get it right and, and uh, try, fail, adjust and, and make it a little bit better this year than last year because we hold you as being so incredibly precious. Without you, we've got nothing. What is this organizational structure for if we haven't got you? So we hold you very dear with regard to this. That's why it's incredibly special to have you here. We're, I, I am, I'm incredibly th thankful, immensely thankful, for the fact that you're participating and you, that you're here this week. Thank you. On behalf of the company, thank you. Now, in the arena, you've noticed, we've seen it in the Olympics. Sometimes there's a tendency to take unfair advantage when you get down to serious competition. Isn't that the truth? Does unfair play ever pay off? Would you rather be Lance Armstrong today? The Tour de France, put together in 1903. 21 days, grueling. The comparison is it's the same as climbing Mount Everest three times. It's the same as running uh, several marathons a week for three solid weeks. Absolutely, totally grueling. The competition is so fierce, there's a tendency to do whatever's necessary to try to win. The winning becomes the all-important thing. And I'm not going to take away from a moment from saying that it's not in the hearts and minds of every one of them. About seven or eight years ago, the Olympians were asked, they got a cross-section of them together and said, listen, if you could be world champion in your sport and get all the glory and all the remuneration and all the fanfare that that would bring for five solid years, as a result of being the best in the entire world in your sport. But you knew you were going to die in five years because you took steroids to do it. Would you do it? 87% said they'd do it. Is there a tendency for humans, one of us, to be drawn to unfair leverage, unfair advantage in a very competitive situation? There are certain tendencies to step over the line. Ask yourself this question. You're looking at you. Are you stepping over the line? You've got a personal life. You've got a social life. You've got a business life. Your health is a life. In essence, really, when you look at this right here, your health is your wealth. Isn't that the truth? Your health is your wealth. Is that true? <laughs> Just being glad to be alive, being glad to participate. I took the position from the very beginning, if we're going to form principles for this corporation, I'm a person of priority. If you get to know me a little bit better, I have a lot of priorities. I assert them in writing every, every morning of my life. Uh, my wife, uh, over 25 years, spotted me not doing it one day, and she says it's unusual not to see you sitting in there. And I spend two hours with pen and paper. That's just me. I'm not expecting you to do the same thing. I wouldn't expect you to go to the gymnasium with Brad Fennell and, ex and expect to go through a workout, a physical workout like he does. I know I've interviewed him, I know and understand what he does, and I understand what that's all about because I've been there. I wouldn't expect you to be able to do that, but you can do your part. You can have your priorities, and whatever you reinforce gets stronger. Spoonful by spoonful. If I was to, was to serve you a porterhouse steak, you don't just stick your fork in it and stick it in your mouth. You will sever it into little pieces. Isn't that true? You'll cut it into little pieces first, bite-side pieces, and you'll do a little bit of a time just enough. If I only had two minutes this morning 
I would have been on my elliptical for two minutes. You say, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Because if, if you scan the inside of your body during the day as a result of what you did in the morning to exercise a little bit, you will know that you're walking a little bit easier. You feel a little bit better, even with two minutes. I've done just two minutes because that's all I had. I said, no, I've got two minutes. I'm going to spend two minutes. And there's always two minutes or there's always 12 minutes or if I can do it 20 minutes or if I can put in an hour, I will put in an hour. But don't tell me there's not time. You're running around like a chicken that's had its head cut off telling me you haven't got enough time. Enough time to do what? You're running through the forest to get to the next forest to get to the next forest. You didn't know, notice any leaves on the trees. What is that all about? Stop to smell the roses? Are you kidding me? No, really, ultimately, we're a team. This is, there's a sense of oneness here. There's two, two outside bodies, and they take a perspective on life. Let's get a little closer to this. We haven't done it before, but I want to go here. The religious element of life take the position that God is. Pretty interesting statement. The scientific side of life say that energy is. Hmm. Almost looks similar. On the religious side, they say God is everywhere, evenly present always. All powerful, all knowing, all wise, all loving. When you go back to the scientist, he says energy is everywhere, evenly present always. There's no place it isn't. It's all powerful. Same definition. If you put them both together, they're really saying the same thing. What if we do this? Source, energy. And we just put those two together. We said, okay, let's, let's just bring it together. Two opposing teams get nothing done. Congress is just a giant argument. Have you not noticed that? That doesn't work. I don't want to do what doesn't work. You do what works. Do what works. Moderation in all things. And for the impetuous people, that's hard. What do you mean moderation? I said, if you've only got two minutes, do two minutes. If you can sit down with a piece of paper, knock off 20. If you were talking to me, because I'm an expert at that, I've done it for 40 years, I knock off 20 pages. Are you going to do that? No, you haven't got time to do that. You won't spend the time to do that. It's important to me, maybe not so important to you, but you could knock off 20. I can knock off 30 of them. It takes me five minutes. Do you have five minutes to spend with your pen and paper to put down your priorities of life? Say, I'm healthy, strong, and vibrant. I have tremendous endurance. I feel wonderful. Once you make the statement that you feel wonderful, your body interprets that as instructions. Oh, is that how you wanted to feel? You got up kind of draggy, but if, oh, I feel wonderful. And it rises up to suit the occasion. You lay down tracks. And then you reinforce it. I don't have a day in my life that I don't write down. I love, respect, honor, and cherish my family. And I love spending time with them. Goes down in writing. Over and over. Mile and sheath forming around that idea. That's a belief I want absolutely, totally to be there. I'm not going to take it for granted that it's going to be there all by itself. I'm never going to take my family for granted. I'm sorry. That's not the way this works. I do, that's the work of a relationship is you work at it. You work at it. Work at what? How you want it to be. Wrap it. Wrap it. Wrap it. If I only had time to write down three affirmations, I would write three. If I don't have time to write it, I will say it to myself in the car. Listen to my disc in the car. Don't tell me I haven't got time to do this stuff. I got nothing but time to do that stuff. It's input into my computer, which is going to determine how I act and react all day long. Is that not important to you? Do you not respect yourself enough to do that? See, we show you what to do. The question is, are you a good student? Psychological armor, you armor yourself up. You can do it with your pen every day. You can do it with your vocals every day. You're dealing with you on a daily basis. And you deal with you before you deal with everybody else. You respect and honor yourself and walk tall, shoulders back, plate clean. There's no reason to cheat. Do you have to cheat? I don't think you do. I really don't. I, my suggestion to you is we... We play hard, but we play clean. That's what this corporation's all about. It's not about sneaky Pete business. That's not what it's all about. I want to be able to look you in the eye and have you be able to look me back without cowering. I want to look into the, the windows of your soul. Look right into your heart and know. And I can tell just by looking at you. I told the kids that when they were young. I'm always going to be able to look at you and tell whether or not you're lying. I have that ability. 
I can just look you in the eye and I can tell whether or not you're lying to me. And the truth comes out, doesn't it? Is honesty the best policy? I think it is. I think that's a good way to live. Source energy from the within. Draw on it on a regular basis. Here's what I want you to do. I think this is important. I think everybody here can relate to this. Affirm who you are. Pray for what you want. Affirm who you are. Pray for what you want. Praying is beckoning to what? Your higher self. Your sense of higher self on the inside. Maxi me and mini me. Maxi me, your higher self, is you rating 10 out of 10 in every possible consideration of who you potentially could be. That's your maxi me. Mini me is how it's turned out so far. <laughs> you draw on maxi me. Shooting for perfection, expecting excellence. Shooting for perfection. That's the best you could possibly be. Drawing on the 10 out of 10. You know you're only a 4 or you're a 6 or you're a 7.5 or even the Russian judge loved you, you're a 9.5. But you're not just there yet. And you draw on that. You pray to that. Okay, You pray to that inner self, that higher self, that sense of source that lives inside of you. It's not out there in the cloud someplace. It's right here. I pray for good results. I pray that that presentation this afternoon at 3 o'clock is just going to go fabulous. I'm just going to appeal to these people. They're going to love me. I'm going to get in there and say all the right words. I'm just going to do it right. We're going to just make it have a wonderful relationship. It's going to be a lifelong lasting relationship. And they're going to take their brothers and sisters and their, their different people that they know. And I'm going to get business from this. And it's just going to radiate and generate. It's going to be like a tree with all kinds of branches. It's going to be a magnificent presentation at 3 o'clock. And before you know it, when you start to talk to yourself like this, you're so pumped and so enthusiastic and so optimistic, you can't wait to get in the door. Instead of biting your finger, fingernails, I've said it to you, you know, before, what are you doing when your knuckles are six inches off the door? Worrying about the fact that it's going to go the same way the last one did? Or are you enthusiastically involved in how you want it to go? You pray for that. The word prayer is not a bad word. It's a four-letter word. It's a good word. It's just not being used enough. It's been a lot of good stuff come down the pike, and we forgot, we forgot about it. You can't forget about yourself. You can't forget about what this is all about. Now, I went through my own arena this past year. It was the greatest challenge of my life. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. My wife and I went to St. Lucia for a vacation, get away, and as we were experiencing that, there was a picture of mountains on the horizon. And she said, I want to climb that mountain. I said, what? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? And I looked at her, I said, I'm, thinking, I'm looking at it, and, and what she was talking about was what looks like the smaller mountain in that picture, which is a little bit farther away, but it's actually two feet, 200 feet higher than the one in the, in the foreground. It's 200 feet higher. She says, I want to climb that mountain. And I'm absolutely, totally, you know, with a D temperament, you tell them anything, they don't react for a couple of days, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm fixed. I'm not moving. Uh, my head's going in the wrong direction. I don't, I'm not feeling good about this. But I know her very well. And for a few days, and we did two different resorts, and the first one we could see the mountains, and then as we moved to the second resort, and the second resort, I want you to remember this, was a place called Jade Mountain, Jade Mountain in St. Lucia. And the interesting part about Jade Mountain was that your room, where you stay in this incredible resort, built by a Russian-Canadian St. Lucian architect. Your room has three walls. There is no fourth wall. That's outside. When you stay in your room, you're outside. And they put a little mosquito net around your four-poster at night. And all you hear all night long is crickets, like you've never heard crickets before, tree frogs, which are the noisiest of all. You're right out there. This was an arena for me. And believe me, when she first told me about it, I didn't know what I was walking into. You've got to be kidding me. I'm not sure I can do this. What is that? 
Now, granted, the room was about 900 square feet. It was, it was marvelous, first class. And the fellow that designed this place, he made everyone totally different. There's, 50, I think, 52 different rooms in this place. Even the toilets were different in every room. Every, every experience, and you, and you had an infinity pool in your room. An infinity pool right there. It's just, wow. Five star, by the way. And when we got to our room, it faced looking at the mountains. <laughs> My birthday was on Friday coming. We got there on the weekend. Every day, all day, I had to look at those mountains. I started to imagine... Going home on the airplane, her having climbed the mountain, and I didn't. <laughs> Nothing inside of me could live with that. I was very uncomfortable with that. My birthday was coming on Friday. We we're going to leave on the Sunday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I'm looking, looking, feeling, trying, testing my stomach. I'm testing here, this. This is talking to this. I'm in this open arena. I'm learning how to sleep with all this noise. We're starting to enjoy it. We have to go upstairs for our dinner. And we booked our dinners for 7 o'clock at night. I counted the steps to get up there. There are no elevators or escalators. 117 steps to get up to my five-star dinner. Finally, by Monday, going into Tuesday, I submitted my will. I said, fine. I'm a traditionalist like this. I said, fine. I'll climb the mountain on my birthday. I'll do it on my birthday. I will never forget this experience. I'll do it on my birthday. She can do it. I can do it. I had no doubts about her. She's a champion in her own right. She keeps herself in top shape. She exercises five times a week. Each one of those uh, workouts is incredibly grueling. Aerobics, uh, weight-bearing, the whole thing. Marvelous. I don't do so much. <laughs> but I'm thinking, if she can do it, I can do it. If I just do it the way I'd eat that steak one chunk at a time, because I always take big projects and I divide it into small projects. Okay, small chunks. I always divide. Spring, summer, fall, and winter, I always divide everything into at least four chunks. Start in the first one. You get anything done, you're going to get everything done. If I just have to get it started, then it'll create a momentum, and before you know it, I'm going to realize my objective. So we book it, and they have to take us in a car over there. It takes a half, almost three quarters of an hour to get there. And uh, previous to that, we'd taken a, a cruise, and we went to the other side of it, and it looked worse on the other side than it did on this side, and they said, that's the side you're going to go up. So, just, you, know. you know, it's like you go through Nasby's door knocking class. It's the first door you're ever going to knock on. I was just like, mm -hmm. and we've got the running shoes on, the shorts, you know, uh, and there's one guide for four people. They have 20 guides, both male and female, and the guides grow up. They're, they're born in a village that live the, right close to the mountain, and as kids, they play on the mountain, so they're used to the mountain. Nobody in the world has ever been a guide that's ever worked out, only the kids that grow up near the mountain because it's, it's playtime for them as kids. And they keep a good close eye on you. And they said two bottles of water each. Okay. So there was four of us. And the other couple was uh, an oil executive. She had a PhD, a doctorate in, in oil. And, um, and her husband named Moose. <laughs> Would he be a high eye? Moose. And we started. And as it started off, and they warned us ahead of time, they said, uh, when, by the time you get to number three, uh, the third level, because they divided into four chunks, uh, the, the third level, there is a bench there, and that's the point of no return. So if you feel, you know, feeling like you can't make it, that's, you can sit there, and you can either wait for us to come back down, or just, you know, just stop. You don't have to go to the top. It's not imperative to go to the top if you feel you can't make it. By the end of the first one, number one, my wife has pre-decided I was not going to make it. She took one look at this. It's not a chance. He's not going to make it. 
I don't have anybody rooting for me, okay? <laughs> when I started, Moose and his wife were behind me, but I could feel him climbing up my shanks. And I'm just, what is, I'm, what? And before you know it, Moose passed me, his wife passed me, and I'm the straggler. You've got to understand that this is equivalent. This is, if, as the crow flies up the mountain, it's a quarter of a mile, but on the GPS, it's two and a half miles. This is two and a half miles on a 45. Some of it was at a 60 degree angle. This is equivalent to 43 football fields, if you get my drift, on a 45. I don't know when the last time you went up a ladder, but you know how you felt when you got to the top. 43 football fields of rock, twisted rock, upside down and back, grab branches and roots, and then it rained three times when we were going up there. Sloppy and messy and choppy and the rest of it. And every one of them seemed to have the endurance of a racehorse, but me. Now, I don't know if you've seen those movies when, you know, uh, four or five of them or six or seven of them, the planes crash, they're in the Sahara Desert and they're going across and they've got an ID, a fellow leading them, come on, you guys, come on, pick it up, pick it up, and there's a straggler. There's a straggler that can't make it, and we all sympathize with the straggler. He said, come on, come on, come on, get up, get up. I was the straggler. <laughs> That's one thing to win and score points and be good at what you're doing and so on and so forth. It's another thing to experience the feeling of being the straggler, and I had that opportunity that day. Every 50 to 75 feet, my heart was pumping so hard, my head was exploding like this. It was everything I could do to get my breath, and they're sitting there waiting for us. You ready? I'd get up to the next one, boom, boom. I had about 18 of those experiences where my, it's just like I ran the fast, if you could imagine this thing running, the fastest 100 yard dash I'd ever run in my entire life and I was really absolutely totally at about 18 times climbing that mountain. My arena was just about a 20 foot circle. Talk about having to live in the present tense. I had to live right there. I could not look over the sides. It was all trees and everything else. You had no problem with depth perception. That didn't bother you, okay? So if you're free, afraid of heights, that wouldn't bother you. My wife is not too good with heights, so you know she was concerned about that, but the way this mountain was structured with the trees and everything else, it didn't affect her. That was good. And so there's no optical illusion about falling or this type of thing, but it's just the rocks in front of you. And they're all pointy, jagged things, and you've got to reach up. So it's all thighs going up, okay? You've got to step up, and you've got to go two feet up or three feet up, but it's all one leg at a time. You can't jump up, you, because if you did take a tumble, you know, you'd be coming down about 100 miles an hour down that hill. So you've got to watch what you do, hold on tight, and just concentrate totally on the next step, the next bite, the next nibble. And all you could see ahead was about 50 to 75 feet. That's all. And then it took a turn and then it went. Because in St. Lucia, everything is like this. You get to the next turn and, oh my God. And I'm, and I'm looking up like this. God, are you kidding me? And it was a never ending story. I didn't know where the top was, so it just it seemed to never end. We got to number three, and the, the, the woman that was with us. Her knee, she said, I got a bit of a trick knee. My left knee is not too good. And she says, I think I'll, I'll wait. Moose is off like a bat out of hell. He's gone. <laughs> and Moose wasn't light. He was, he was, he had, he was chunky. I wouldn't say porky, kind of chunky. <laughs> sort of sturdy, but they didn't call him Moose for nothing. I mean, this, this guy was gone. My wife is hot on his heels. These are, she's like a mountain goat, for crying out loud. Light-footed. <laughs> And I'm, what? <laughs> There's no way I'm not going up that mountain. Three to four. Four to five. And then I'm sitting on top of the mountain. And a dog actually passed me up the mountain. <laughs> You see him over there? He passed me. That dog climbs the mountain every day. His name's Brownie. A woman down the hill owns the dog. He goes up every day. He climbs the mountain. He's having a nice rest. You can tell by the look in my face. I'm toast. All right? But I'm at the top of the mountain, and they told me that going down is going to be even harder. And I'm thinking, with my sense of strategy, I'm thinking, okay, my thighs are ready to explode. 
And, you know, I, I exercise them. And uh, I think, okay, going down, we've got to go down backwards like this. You can't get forwards like this or you could take a tumble. So you've got to sort of go slide back like this and hold on real tight. And it's going to be ankles and feet and uh, knees a little bit and so on and so forth. I think I've got an advantage. I've got the short legs. Okay, this is going to be good. <laughs> and I start to go down. By the time I'm halfway down the hill, my feet start to go rubbery. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but my, my feet from my ankles or my knees down were going rubbery on me to the point that I couldn't trust my feet any longer. I wasn't sure when I took a two or a three foot step down on one leg that that, that foot was actually going to be able to hold it and I didn't want to break my ankle. I didn't want to, you know, cause that kind of a problem. And so I'm starting to distrust my own players. I mean, this is my body. I, I know what it can do and what it can't do, but it's starting to give up on me a little bit and I'm starting to question it a little bit. And... Doubt triggers fear. Right? Doubt can be eliminated with good positive input and consequently you can eliminate all fear. It always starts with doubt. So you've got fear in your life, you sit there and say it started with doubt. With good positive input we can rearrange that and totally eliminate the fear. So I'm talking to myself all the way up the mountain and all the way down the mountain. I'm having the self-talk situation of a lifetime. Focusing only on the next 20 feet circle. I, I'm not looking at anything else. I'm in the, in the moment. I'm talking to myself. I've got I'm my own motivator. I'm talking, okay, you got to be a mountain goat. Okay, just one step at a time. One, so you gotta, okay, just take it easy. Just, okay, hold on tight. Okay, that's, and I'm, I'm into self-talk like I've never been in my entire life. A little bit farther down, my left knee started to talk to me a little bit. My right kidney started to talk to me a little bit. I wasn't sure what that was. What is that? The, the, um, our assistant, our guide, recognized that I was the weak link in the chain. <laughs> he spent special care with me coming down the mountain because if anybody has a problem in that regard, they have to carry you down the mountain. <laughs> and they'd had that experience before. Um, where they've got to put you on a stretcher and carry you down. That takes 16 to 18 hours to take somebody down with two people. They, they'd had that experience before, so the guides do their work. They're worth their salt, right? You want a good guide. You want a good coach. He was with me every moment. Such empathy, nice kid. I'm kidding around with him, joking around with him a little bit, and so on. we're having a good relationship, but he's watching every step and he's pointing where to put my feet next, what to do next. And believe me, I needed every moment of it. I never appreciated good teaching, training, and coaching until I started coming down that mountain. Because sometimes, you know, you outgrow certain things and you don't appreciate it. I was brought back to that level where I was the student, I was the straggler, I was the one that couldn't quite make it, I was the one that was dragging behind. And that was one of the finest experiences of my life. Five hours total up and down. Two and a half miles up, two and a half miles down. It was a never-ending story coming down. We sat there for a few minutes afterwards and we had planned a two-hour massage afterwards. We were not stupid. You said, you're going to need a two-hour massage. We got there a little late. And we asked if we could just go to our room and hit, you know, Kath headed for the shower. There was only one of them. I cannot stop myself. I ended up in the infinity pool. <sighs> I'm in the infinity pool because we've got the massage coming, two-hour massage, everything I can do to walk. <laughs> no, no, believe me, it was not going faster than this. My wife would attest to this. Not going any faster than this. The two-hour massage was absolutely magnificent, but then we had half an hour until supper. I've got to go up 117 steps. Now, only a guy like me would count them, but I count them. 117 of the most grueling steps of my entire life, but by God, I was hungry. I'm going there. This was an arena like I've never experienced in my entire life. It's the hardest physical work I have ever done in my entire life, and I've, I've done a lot of stuff. Never like that before. 
The mountains are called the Pitons. P-I-T-O-N-S, the Pitons. And it's a Cajun word because St. Lucia was taken over by the French and the English seven different times, back and forth seven times. So the people there, they created Cajun as a language someplace in between French and English that you really can't understand a word that they're saying. And the Pitons means mountains. And I realized at that moment what it meant to be a captive audience what it meant to draw on every fiber of my being, what it meant to go through tremendous pain and doubt, self-doubt, what it meant to try to find endurance where there wasn't any endurance. It took my thighs four solid days to recover. I now know what it's like to be 101 years of age. I have felt it. My wife was up there with me, you see. She was at the top of the mountain as well. There's a picture of her and I. There we are. You know, she, she climbed that mountain with me. There we are having a toast. And it is the toast of the town because I've been there and done that. And here's what it's done for me. This is like the firewalk, people. It's like the firewalk. And some people have experienced the firewalk, and you know what that's all about. I'm left with this. No matter what experience I come against now, no matter what the challenge, in my mind, my heart, and my soul, I'm sitting there saying, if I can climb that damn mountain, I can do that. That's in me now. It's not inside of you. That's inside of me. Here's my challenge for you. If you have the heart and you've got the money and you've got the time and you want the challenge, I challenge you to do exactly the same thing. Go to Jade Mountain and spend some time in an open environment where there isn't a fourth wall and then set out to climb that mountain and go through the experience that I've gone through, that my wife has gone through. See, we went through it together. We went through it together. What a wonderful experience for us as a shared experience uh, as, as a family to go through that. Marvelous, marvelous thing. I was glad that she egged me on to do it. Probably of my own accord, I never would have done it. If it wasn't her doing this, I never would have done it. Is there somebody sitting beside you that's giving you the elbow, that's saying, why don't we go do that? And have you been giving all kinds of resistance when really ultimately that's probably what you should be doing because you're going to find part of yourself that you've never found before as a result of the experience. It was a marvelous experience. The arena is the marketplace. The arena is your real estate office. The arena is your family. And there's all kinds of challenges in there. There is. What's it for? It's, it's there to bring the most and the best out of you. Did the mountain bring the most and the best out of me? Yes, I'll never forget it. On my gravestone, it's going to be right up there with my trip around the world when I was 27 years of age. As, as the most valuable physical endurance experience I've ever had in my entire life. You know, I, and I uh, look at, uh, you know, 50 marathons in every state, and I sit there and say, he's done something I could never do. I have nothing but absolute reverence for that. I could never do it. I would never even want to do it. It's not on my agenda. It's not who I am, but it certainly is in Keith's, on Keith's agenda, and he has done that. He's set an example for all of us, and my congratulations goes to him for that. You see, no matter what the challenge, if you armor yourself up properly, if you hang around with the right kind of people, if you think the right kind of thoughts, you can have and do anything you want to in this earth. And the, th the trick of it all is to try to enjoy it. That moment-by-moment -moment experience of climbing the mountain, I think, has brought out a better me. It certainly instigated humility inside of me and an appreciation factor. And I'm glad that I've, I live with um, the most wonderful w woman in the world who helps to bring out a better me on a daily basis. I couldn't do all this without her. She's there. We've got a family of seven and five boys, two girls. You met them last year all on stage. Love each and every one of them. It's just unbelievable. And that, that family will be growing and uh, leaps and bounds and, and in the future. And my wife Kathy does such a fabulous job, such a wonderful job. It's a joy to watch her because she works harder than me. And she's more focused in a lot of cases than me. And sometimes I have to try to slow down her horses a little bit because she gets going so fast in any one direction. And maybe from a coaching standpoint, I can add a little bit of advice from time to time, maybe whispering. I can't go higher than whispering. And we share things together. 
and we go places together because I'm either on the job with you people doing something with Exit or I'm with her. That's the way my life is. I, I don't have another life. There is no other life. And uh, it's a joy to uh, have the kids go and grow and they're all up and out and to watch uh, the blooming of all of that. And it's like reading a book. You just don't know how it's all going to turn out. You know, it's exciting and you never really want it to end and ultimately it never does. This is a marvelous experience. I, I wouldn't be any place else other than Exit. I love Exit to, to the core. I love everything that's going on. I'm just so proud of everybody, my tech people and, and my sales people and my management people, my executive people, so incredibly proud. But believe me, I couldn't be here, I wouldn't do it. All by myself, you know, I wouldn't have climbed the mountain. All by myself, I probably wouldn't have built Exit if it wasn't for my wife, Kathy, helping me along the way each and every step, every breath of the way, it just wouldn't have happened. I just love her to bits. So I want to bring her up here. Let's go. Come on up.